record today's uh, roundtable, so I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, I am working two computers, so just bear with me for a second. Um, we do want to encourage you to use the chat. Uh, please put any questions that you have into the chat, and as we go along, we'll uh, try to address them uh, before the end of the seminar. Um, we also uh, will be having a fireside chat where we'll turn the recording off and just have a, a, a casual uh, and informal conversation with each other. Uh, and that will start at 11 Eastern. Uh, for those of you who didn't already uh, sign up, um, we do have um, a, a form in the Google, a, a Google form, and I will post it in the chat uh, so you can provide us with your contact information. I'm so happy to be here today with all of you. My name is George Edwards. I'm the Chief Accreditation Officer at the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, NEASC. The host for today's roundtable, as always, is uh, Dr. Christoph Ott. Christoph is a former Managing Director and current member of the board of the Lausanne American School in Lausanne, Switzerland. He's also the Director of the Quality Schools Certificate, a Swiss-based quality cert certification program for schools. He has extensive enrollment management experience in international markets and guiding organizations to achieve long-term goals. He's very skilled at introducing new and innovative ideas in secondary education and implementing them through empowerment, motivation, and inspiration. Christoph lives in Lausanne, Switzerland, with his wife and two children. And uh, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Christoph. Christoph. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for, for joining. Thank you to the panelists for coming. George, if you could go into presentation view on PowerPoint, that would be oh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, let me now maybe introduce George, if I may. Uh, so my co-host today is George Edwards, who is, as mentioned before, the Chief Accreditation Officer of the New England Associations of Schools and Colleges, where he assists schools throughout New England and around the world in the process of continuous improvement by participating in accreditation. George was a public school educator in the United States, serving as a high school principal of several schools, including some explicitly designed around the NIAS standards. George lives in Sanapi, um, New Hampshire. So, let me maybe uh, give you a, a quick background. And for those of you who have been joining these, uh, these uh, round table discussions, you know that, that part, uh, the inception part of where this came from. But basically I presented uh, at the NIASC annual conference in December, 2021. Uh, George was my host for the session. And this was a session on uh, strategic planning in times of crisis, uh, which was basically lessons learned in terms of strategic planning that I had conducted at the Lisbon American School at the time. Uh, but also interviews that I was conducting with school leaders around the world, including some of the participants today on this call. And um, out of this presentation, uh, George and I came to the conclusion that schools either reinvent the wheel uh, or hire consultants, but they do not speak with each other. And so this is our, oh God, seventh round table, George, sixth or seventh round table. Sorry if I'm getting, not getting this right. <clears throat> and uh, our intention is really to get schools to, to have an opportunity to share best practices from uh, with each other, but we also want to broaden the scope a little bit. So we always have, um, uh, or we try to include panelists that are uh, outside of education uh, to share best practices from outside of education. So um, before we dive into the discussion, I'd really uh, like to thank the three panelists today and I'd like to introduce them. So our first panelist here is uh, Tim Stewart. Dr. Tim Stewart is a regional education officer uh, with the US Department of State of Overseas Schools. Tim has served as the head of school at the International Community School of Addis Abeba, the executive director of strategic programs and high school principal of Singapore American School and the high school principal of Jakarta International School. Tim has been international and cross-cultural educator for 30 years serving schools in Ethiopia, Turkey, Switzerland, where I got to meet him, by the way, Indonesia, Singapore, and, uh, and on the Navajo Reservation in the United States. Uh, Dr. Stewart is the author of and co-author of a number of books, notably PLC at Work and the IB Primary Years Program, Optimizing Personalized Transdisciplinary Learning for All Students, Personalized Learning in a PLC World, Student Agency Through Four Critical Questions. 
Tim's research and writing reflect his passion for creating an optimal school environment so that all kids can learn and engage at the highest level. A third culture kid himself, Tim was raised and educated in France and Germany, and Tim holds an EDD from Seattle Pacific University and an MED from the College of New Jersey and a BA from Wheaton College. Thank you, Tim, for joining us today from Amman, Jordan, uh, which is uh, yeah, not your usually home base, let's put it that way. <laughs> Um, our it's second crazy. panelist today uh, is uh, Professor Dr. Olaf Bach. So Olaf, who is talking to us from Zurich right now, um, he is the co-founder of Management Kit, which is a digital management consultant allowing leaders in education and beyond to apply proven state-of-the-art approaches to solve organizational issues and build management capabilities on the job. Olaf teaches management and organizational design at the University of St. Gallen, um, one of the leading European business schools, and as a visiting professor at the Berlin-based School of Weissensee Art Academy, where he co-founded the Design in Tech Accelerator Design Farm in Berlin. Olaf was a senior project manager at a leading global strategy consulting firm and has published on topics of globalization, management, and the intersection of economics and creative industries. Thank you for joining us, Olaf. And our last panelist today is Tim Carr. Uh, Tim uh, has served as the head of some of the iconic international schools in the world for over 20 years. Tim has been on a quest to discover and share some of the keys to transformational learning with an eye towards the future of schooling in preparing cadres of students and educators for the unknown. Tim focuses on building and nurturing learning communities with vivid and motivating vision. Since returning to his passport country 2017 in the United States with Avenues the World School, Tim has helped launch and lead Avenues Online and is now a, a senior advisor. So Tim, thank you very much for joining us today also. So um, let me briefly, briefly set the stage uh, a little bit what uh, George and I were thinking when we came up with this topic, but also uh, where uh, we uh, what came out of discussions with the various panelists ahead of this uh, topic today. So if you can maybe go to the next slide, George. Um, basically, what, what we kind of uh, wanted to uh, uh, focus on today is um, change. Change is inevitable, inevitable. You can't you can't prevent it from happening. So either you can like a, you can you can it's like like the waves. Um, so you can either be a rock and try to fight the waves and get worn out or you can surf them. Um, I personally try to surf those waves as much as I can, but to illustrate some of those changes and put into perspective, you've got the horse trolley to uh, the Volkswagen electric van, a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of technology right there. I'm a big fan of those Volkswagen vans, by the way. Um, and uh, when you look at switchboard operators, which not only do those office configurations don't really exist anymore, is the profession to exist anymore, to co-working spaces something that I'm extremely familiar with because I, I've done a lot of this and I still do a fair amount of it. And when you look at education, you have classrooms uh, with over 40 kids all neatly stacked up in a row um, to classrooms which are fortunately very often much smaller. Um, there's always a role of technology in it, but fundamentally, uh, when you look at a classroom setting, um, change is not as evident or apparent as it would be in some of the other examples that would come, would look when, that would come to mind when you look back 100 years. And ultimately, as we go into the next slide, the goal is today, um, as a thought exercise, ask ourselves, what is it that we can do in education to prepare for uh, the unknown, uh, the next 100 years? So um, with that being said, I would like to hand over the word to uh, Tim uh, Stewart, please. Yes. Uh... Hello, everyone from Amman, Jordan. I'm here at a conference uh, with the Department of State. Uh, it is an honor to be with uh, all of you. And thank you, Christoph, uh, for, for the invitation to speak with all of you. Uh, go ahead with the next slide. Uh, uh, really, what we're talking about is the, the future of learning and, and what better place to start than, than the why and, uh, and the how uh, of learning. So my section really is going to focus on, on what uh, learning looks like in the future. And so we'll start with that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, most of what I'm talking about will be kind of referenced in, in these three books. These are kind of the three latest books that I have out. Uh, if you ever want to look at them as a reference, uh, some of the discussion points or some of the things that we'll be talking about are, are referenced uh, in, in these various books. Next slide, please. 
So the future is here. Here we need to we need to deal with it. Uh, and you know, for a long time, those of us who are kind of futurists have been saying the future is coming. The future is coming. The future is coming. Now the message is the future is here. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's the provocation for today, and and some of this, the answer to this, will be discussed in our in our fireside chat probably. But uh, let's consider the impact of Chat GPT in your classroom and in your school. Uh, what what are the some of the changes that are going to have to happen in your schools as a result of this? And considering that this is just the beginning, we'll talk more about Chat GTP uh, in the fireside chat. Next slide, please. So uh, here's a here's a, a quote. Uh, but I, what I love about this quote is that it says that the the it's the learners uh, that will inherit the future. The learned uh, will find themselves equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. And I think that that's uh, really very very true. And many of us as educators, we continuously find ourselves teaching or creating a school environment for a future. Uh, for 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 our past and not our children's future. Next slide, please. So, really, what we're talking about, and and a lot of researchers have been talking about this. Uh, one of them is is John Hattie. If you haven't read any of John Hattie's work, uh, I think it's really really important. And obviously, it has to be read uh, uh, carefully and and intelligently. But what what I like about John Hattie is that he simplifies kind of the impact that certain things have on student learning. And if you if you understand um, uh, some of his work, if you have a uh, if you have an effect size of 0.4 or greater, that means that the learning is 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 more than a normal child over the course of a normal year. That's how he measures everything. And he takes thousands and thousands of studies and measures all kinds of different things to see whether they have a positive or negative impact on student learning. Uh, it, for those of you who are international educators, uh, it'd be, you'd be interested to know that this, one of the worst things that you can do for child learning, the, the thing that has the most negative impact is transition, students transitioning from school to school to school, country to country, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, learning uh, approach or, or curriculum to curriculum that has a negative impact on learning. One of the things that has the highest impact on learning is uh, he calls self-directed grades, uh, things like uh, teacher efficacy, collective teacher efficacy, which is basically teachers working together to ensure higher levels of learning for students. So it's really an interesting, uh, interesting research and really the analysis of metadata in our field. So well worth uh, a read and a study. Next slide, please. So first, let me just talk about the, the global landscape uh, over the next slide, please. The Over the course of the uh, past 10 years, I've visited over 150 schools and really taken a look at around the world on, on five different continents, looking at trends in education, uh, what's happening around the world and what's having an impact. What are some of the best practices out there? Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, and really came down with these two basic categories. I found that there are some schools that would that I would categorize as highly effective and some schools that I would categorize as learning progressive. Uh, highly effective schools are schools that have systems and structures in place to ensure that kids are learning at the highest level. These are schools that 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 are many of our international schools, I would say, categorize themselves as highly or would, would be uh, highly effective. They know how to get students the grade. They know how student, to prepare students for exams, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, usually get their kids into great universities. And then there's learning progressive schools that uh, are more project-based. Students have agency. They have all of these kinds of things. Um, uh, and what we're looking at is really trying to figure out a combination of these two things. We need to be highly effective and learning progressive. Next slide, please. So the the fact the the factors that we observed in these highly effective and learning progressive schools is that all of them were uh, collaborative. So the most effective schools that we saw, the ones that were ensuring students learning at the highest level, had a collaborative environment where teachers were working together. They were working together to ensure success for all of their students. Next slide, please. They also, all of them had a guaranteed and viable curriculum. Every one of these schools knew exactly what they wanted students to learn, understand, know, and be able to do. Uh, they, they had clarity in their curriculum, what, whatever that curriculum was. We're not uh, saying it was one curriculum or another, but they knew exactly what they wanted to students to know, understand, and be able to do. Next slide, please. 
They also had uh, systems and strategies for intervention and acceleration. So they knew uh, when, when students were, were struggling, they knew exactly how to intervene to make sure that they were going to obtain those, uh, those learning targets. And when students already knew it, they had ways of accelerating kids' learning uh, on the learning continuum. These were some of the similarities that we saw in these 150 schools. Now, on, uh, next slide, please. And, and really uh, what, what it boiled down to is when student te these collaborative teams were, were working together, they were uh, asking these four critical questions, what I would call a professional learning community. These are the learning professional learning communities that work questions. What do we expect students to learn? That's question one. Question two is how will we know when they've learned it? So that's assessment. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond when they're not learning? And how will we respond when they already know it? So really, in essence, effective schools, schools that were ensuring that all kids were learning and engaging at, this, at the highest level were actually asking these four questions in one variety or another. Uh, they were asking and answering these questions. Next slide, please. The last component, so that, those were the components of the highly effective schools. The last component of schools that were learning progressive is that they added this concept of student agency. They had this interesting way of giving students power over their own learning. Students own their own learning, they own their own learning process. Um, and, and that was one of the distinctions that made a school be not only highly effective, but also learning progressive. Next slide, please. Uh, Michael Fullen, I'll let you read this, this uh, quote uh, from him. Next slide, please. In order for students to own their own learning, it's important for them to, to understand the learning process. And this is really what I believe uh, the, the, what learning boils down to in the 21st century in the future is students understanding how to learn and what the learning process is. I saw this in many schools. If you're interested in kind of a list of schools, I'd be happy to share that with you. This one, the, the real original idea of this came from a school called Stonefields uh, in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, where you could go up to a fourth grade uh, student or a first grade student, and you could ask them where they were at in the learning process. And they would say, well, I'm right now I'm making meaning or right now I'm in the learning pit. Uh, this is kind of an adaptation of that. There are many schools that have varieties of this kind of process, but question one, question two, question three, question four for us, uh, for me is the learning process. Next slide, please. And really, the questions get turned on their head. Same exact questions that we have teachers ask. Now the students are asking for themselves. This is how they have agency and ownership over their own learning. What do I want to know, understand, be, and be able to do? What is it that I want to know? So when the student starts asking that question, you know that they have agency. Next slide, please. And how will I demonstrate that I learn it? Not only are they now allowing teachers to, uh, or, or schools uh, saying teachers need to develop assessments, the student is now developing criteria for excellence and exemplary work based on how they are going to demonstrate. What tools, what avenue am I going to use to demonstrate that I have learned the, the intended learning target? Question, uh, next, next question, what is it that I'm going to do when I'm not learning? This I love calling the learning pit. The learning process always includes not being able to learn, being stuck. If you're not stuck, you're not learning. And what are the tools that I have at my disposal to get out of the learning pit when I'm not learning to move forward the next step? When you start empowering students with question number three, they are going to learn at a higher level. Question number four, what is it that I'm going to do when I already know it, when I've already learned it? How will I take, what's the next step in my learning? And for schools that are just starting with this and starting to give students agency, they, I would highly recommend that they start with question number four. When, you, when a child has mastered the curriculum, when they've mastered the learning target, when they've demonstrated proficiency in that learning target, target they should be able to ask that question for themselves. What is it that I'm gonna do next? 
How am I going to take this? How am I going to apply this learning into a real world scenario? How am I going to make meaningful connections be between these two concepts? How am I going to uh, take this learning and go a little bit deeper with it? And then the third question, and, and I'm going backwards, they're not on the slide, but the third question is, what am I going to do when I'm stuck? And then the th second, the, the fourth, the third question backwards is how am I going to demonstrate that I've learned it? And then the fourth question really is what do I want to know? So if you need to release agency, return agency, those of you who have a Regio background, you know that it's not about giving students agency, it's about returning agency to them. It's something that maybe many schools have stolen from them over the years. Next slide, please. The most important objective of schools, and, and this is you know, people debate this, but I have come to believe that it is learning how to learn. Uh, this is the, the learning target that trumps all learning is learning how to learn. And I think that we, uh, in many, many schools around the world, we are still focused on what students need to know uh, in order to be a learned individual. What we really need to start focusing on is the teaching kids to learn how to learn, which is through the learning process, which is giving them agency and understanding the learning process so that they can continue to be engaged, high level learning, lifelong learners. Next slide, please. But there you go. That was it. So for me, <laughs> I could talk about this all day, but I hope that I've stuck within the time frame. And uh, looking forward to a, a, a conversation later on. Thank you all very much. So uh, yeah, thank you, Tim. I mean, like 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 a Swiss clock, you know, like your time in Switzerland. That's you know something stuck there. You're you're spot on. No, and and I think um, what I would like to do, and as I encourage the participants, is please use the chat for any questions or any topics or any things that you would like to uh, either ask the panelists. Um, most likely we will talk about this more during the fireside chat, but I would like to make sure that you feel that you have a voice uh, and can also guide the fireside chat a little bit. Um, but yeah, what what a what a message, Tim. Thank you so much. And you know, you've, you've seen so, so, so many schools out there and have really taken a, a researcher's approach to to identifying these uh, these things. And it's you know the, the I, I like your classification along I, I would call it a spectrum of of uh, of uh, you know, highly effective uh, to, uh, you know, learning progressive, which it's not either or, it's and, and you can push the dial in one direction or another. Um, but what really came to me was uh, the image of, of encouraging students not to be the spectators of their own life, but the actors of their own life. And one of the big uh, taglines I use in the course that I teach um, is uh, you're the CEO of your own life. And being a CEO of your own life, and that's where the learning pit comes in, that analogy comes in, that, that entrepreneurial mindset that we should, in my opinion, convey to, to, to the young adults we're educating, it's fail forward. Uh, you know, you fail fast and you fail forward and you learn and you move on. And that's, that's you know, we know this from, from a business entrepreneurial kind of context. You brought this into the context of education, which ultimately very much uh, resonates with me, at least. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Um, so I think... Uh, you know, you, 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 with, with no further ado, I'd like to uh, let Olaf uh, take over the discussion. And Olaf is the <clears throat> panelist who brings that outside perspective uh, from education, even if he has a very solid foot in education, but because of his university background and, and former uh, strategic consultant background, um, I'm really looking forward to hear um, his part of the conversation. George, is there anything that you would like to add before uh, Olaf takes over? No, I just uh, I really appreciate uh, what Tim had to to share with us, and and uh, you know I just I, I guess I really encourage schools to go beyond being, you know, really good schools and include that element of student agency and and really take it to the next level. And it's not to make a pitch uh, in uh, in uh, <laughs> in your name, George, but. Uh, uh, there are tools out there for schools, uh, especially I'm thinking about the ACE accreditation protocol, which puts high, puts a very, very high premium on student agency and encourages schools, schools to, to, to get students to take their own, to take agency or, or take their agency back again. Um, so, okay. So Olaf, why don't you uh, take it over, please? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph. Thank you very much. Also, Tim, I, I'm, I'm almost inclined to do something super radical and, you know, throw out my own slides and uh, have my own talk uh, using your slides <laughs> because so much of what you uh, were talking about resonated so well and I think connects so well with uh, what I'm at least trying to to bring across. 
So if we if we dive right in, so I stay conventional nevertheless and and uh, talk to my own material, and um, go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to talk about organizational capabilities as a key to future-proofing schools. And you know, if I if I stay here for a little moment and reflect on your uh, uh, talk, uh, Tim Stewart, then uh, I would say that um, uh, some of the schools you were talking about have solved some management issues really well, right? They have build some organizational capabilities to make the stuff, uh, the, the kind of value creation that you're describing happen as an, as an organization. And of course, I'm, I'm most interested about like how do organizations do that on a kind of zoomed out meta level? How do they enable certain things to happen within uh, their walls? And uh, if you go to the next slide on that. So when we engage uh, educators, so me and my co-founder at Management Kids, he's a uh, long-serving uh, school head, also in, in, has been a long-serving school head also in Switzerland. And when we in, engage the people we work with, leaders in, in schools, principals, etc., um, almost always there's the question, well, aren't schools unique? Like, isn't your management stuff from, from St. Gallen or Harvard uh, Business Review, is that really relevant for us because we are so different? <laughs> and of course, the answer is, uh, yes, of course, you're super different, right? It's you know, your educational purpose, working with students, enabling learning, that's one of a kind. It's hard to compare even to higher education and, of course, uh, even harder to compare to anything else out there. Um, learning outcomes are something intangible. I mean, you, Tim talked about stats and ways to measure learning progress, super relevant, I guess, super interesting also. But in the end, you know, there are so many different outcomes. Success can take so many different forms in, in terms of uh, growing a student, at least in, in my view, and, and teaching also at, at university, that that I would say, I mean, I mean, it's such a big difference. Yes, you are special. Schools are special. And then, um, you know, it, it's complex communities. It's so people heavy, so many different stakeholders. Like I'm a parent of three. I'm <laughs> very often the parent role in, in the schools and institutions my, my kids attend. And I, I can well imagine how um, uh, how difficult this can be to, to handle that. And, and again, this is something in this form I would never see or find in any other uh, business context. I've worked in pharma, financial services, public service, et cetera. And then again, no, it's it's not unique, right? It's uh, it's absolutely describable in, in, um, in terms that are uh, very common in, in, uh, in management science and management theory. It's, um, uh, I have to shift the windows here a little bit to see my notes here. So those are complex organizational and management challenges, and you have them one way or the other in, uh, in many other contexts. So for example, this, um, uh, this distinction between effective and progressive that Tim was talking about, in, in many technology-heavy industries, this, uh, this is described as ambidexterity, right? So being, being super good and routinized and effective, efficient, in, in what you have done in the past and what you're doing now, and at the same time being able to explore, being crazy about new things and being innovative. Uh, so it's something that, that you can find in with different semantics and terminologies in all kinds of uh, industries. It's private schools, especially, they are businesses, right? You, they, you have to make ends meet. You have to make sure the system is economically viable and sustainable uh, in the long run, and of course, uh, education can be described as a service and quite productively with some elements of the service being um, delivered effectively and efficiently and in innovative measure that that um, is maybe not that easy to to measure but still um, there's an intensive discourse on success and you, you somehow have to relate to that in order to be successful so schools are totally unique and they are not and that has some implications if we go to the next slide and uh, one uh, um, uh, implication that uh, we find very productive here is to shift the perspective because we all work in our organizations, right? We have to meet deadlines. We have to introduce this curriculum. Um, we have this, this maybe this, this new class or this new program that we are setting up. Uh, and that's all in the organization. And I would um, think that the organizations that Tim also described as, as very innovative and progressive they, and maybe implicitly, manage to shift the organization to work on the organization. So we don't only work in the organization doing stuff, but they work on the organization and they reflect and very good at shaping how they do stuff in uh, order to 
um, to uh, keep being excellent and being innovative. So again, uh, you know, reflecting on the slides we saw before, you know, working together, one key ingredient that Tim mentioned, you know, being able to work together, being able to onboard people, new joiners to work together in the same way, uh, that's an organizational capability, being very good at sharing practices of effectively working together. Um, uh, curriculum clarity. Tim said, whatever a curriculum is, being very clear about it, it's, um, it's an organizational capability to create those, this clarity, right? To communicate in a way that everybody understands how does good look like in that case? What do we really want to do in terms of, of um, uh, curriculum? Um, being able to introduce intervention and acceleration. So not in this um, uh, insular context of one classroom, but as an institution across all classrooms and being able to do it here and there and do it again and recognizing it and having a discourse among all teachers, what this is, how it works, why it's good, how it can be even better. That's an organizational capability. And, um, uh, it's, and this capability to, to um, maybe jump ahead already a little bit, is something that is not confined to individual capabilities, but that needs to be shared across the organization. So you need to activate many people in the organization to make something like that work. Practically all people who, who lead to influence the organization, uh, who have a, a leadership function also for their year or for their uh, department, uh, they all need to be on board and play some kind of role in making those kind of things happen. If we quickly go through the next three slides. Um, so we have three levels here. We have uh, the student level, organization capabilities key here. Um, and, and again, you know, the best examples here came from, from Tim already. Um, uh, and I think I've mentioned some of them uh, with regards to curriculum clarity, working together, uh, you know, from the one teacher classroom to the multi-layered, more integrated policy. It's uh, when we when we talk to educational leaders, we talk a lot about collaboration problems, right? How do we work together? How do we set things up to very mundane things like how do we structure meetings and and uh, enable the discourse uh, up to to good proven management practices, ensuring psychological safety, making sure people speak up, making sure that the knowledge that is there in the institution is really shared and and brought to the joint discourse. If we go to the next slide. Uh, of course, we have uh, uh, changes to the school's operating context. So all of a sudden, JET GPT pops up like a global phenomenon that you know educational contexts are, are, are super affected by. And we'll talk about that uh, more in, um, in the fireside chat. The only point I would like to make already about this JET GPT is, again, it's an organizational issue, right? Of course, it, you know, it lands in the classroom and it's an issue for the individual student and teacher relationship, but how does the institution deal with it? And where does the organization happen? How to deal with it productively? How to become innovative in uh, the context of such a shock or opportunity or whatever it is? Again, you, you first have to make sense of it. Next slide. And then, of course, uh, the, the people terrific context in the schools, um, uh, it's, it's in a way easy and, you know, classical management consulting, of course, banks on that to uh, have this kind of sense making and discussion on the top level, right, with the top, top school leaders and maybe with the executive board. Um, but if you really want to build organizational capabilities, if you want to enable the change that Christoph was talking about in the beginning, you need everybody, right? And not everybody in the same way, but everybody somehow needs to uh, be able to um, have a productive relationship to change and do something about it in, in his or her uh, realm. And um, of course, schools as expert organizations, like, in, like we have in many other industries, so this expert organizational feature, you, you often have in health services, um, a lot in pharma, of course, where you have scientists really running the organization in the end. Um, they, um, they are, of course, not trained managers, but uh, all of them, uh, of course, can learn management capabilities. And by that, you know, build this meta muscle, uh, this, uh, this capability to work on the organization and not only uh, in the organization, and by that enable change and strengthen the, the, the key value proposition of a school in, uh, in turn. And then to wrap things up, last slide. Um, so one, one further, please. It's a point I've, I've already made, right? You can, uh, you can uh, 
discuss the things that Tim shared on the level of uh, uh, on the strategic level, on the strategic decision making level. But um, uh, I would suggest, and we can discuss in the side chat, we need to find ways to bring it to all levels of the school to activate the whole organization to support that change, be productive about that change, um, have agency as leaders, as school leaders in that discourse, and not only in, in delivering kind of service of educating students. And with that, I'd like to wrap up. Thank you, Olaf. Wow, this was, uh, this was amazing. And I was observing uh, the thread uh, of the chat and I, I thank you all for contributing. And, and Chrissy, you really started a whole, a whole discussion uh, that reverberated with a lot of the participants, I feel. And, uh, and I think uh, in, in my own words, what, what Olaf was saying was so spot on uh, and got augmented then by the comments by Chris, uh, who's based in China with the cultural dimension. But ultimately it's this, this analogy between um, industry business and schools and and we're in the knowledge-based economy right and in a knowledge-based economy you have to prepare people and that's what we know in schools and chat gpt is a perfect example of this that we are not the holders of information that we have to transmit to students we're we're guides to help students find their way uh, kind of thing and and when you think about this in in in, in the business context which which we you very beautifully illustrated a lot it's it, you know, you look at a collaborative workspace in, in those IT companies that we've all seen or heard about. Well, suddenly, uh, Tim Stewart talks about, you know, the most successful schools are the ones that have a collaborative uh, environment, a collaborative, like collaborative culture. So um, we're, we're seeing a lot of parallels, uh, all of us, and it's being crystallized pretty elegantly by, by the two first panelists, between how we are literally at crossroads with, uh, with, with, with many, many, many things and how we can learn. Uh, if we look outside of the silo of education and try to to pinch ideas and contextualize them in uh, in education, it's the best of both worlds. Um, and obviously, when when Chris is writing uh, in China, you considered buying a, a revolutionary uh, in terms of being counterculture. Uh, if you're trying to push for student agency, uh, obviously there are big forces out there you can't go against. At the same time, when you look at what's happening in China. You have a lot of IT companies who've become super innovative and who, have, who are leading the way of a cultural change. And you said, you used a quote right here on your slide, Olaf, which I love to use, especially uh, within strategic context, is culture eats strategy for breakfast. So it's all about the people, getting the people on board, um, getting the people engaged and buying into, you know, get, get the people who, who you want them to love what they're doing, which in education is probably easier than in many other industries, at least in my opinion. And I come out of engineering, so uh, I guess I'm maybe a, either a very good or a very bad example of this. Um, but in education, it's so much easier to believe in what you're doing. And that energy that you have, that belief, that love you have for your, for your, for your craft, for your job, for, your, for what you spend most of your time doing, which is impacting young adults, um, demands, it really demands engagement and involvement when it comes to orientation and the strategic level. So I think with that being said, I just want to hand it over to George and see if there's any other comments on your end uh, before we let Tim take over for the last part. Thanks, Christoph. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for their contributions in the chat. And thanks to Chrissy for getting the conversation started there. It was, uh, it's really fascinating. And uh, it's, um, you know, just so important for us to focus on student agency and really lifting students up and involving them, you know, just as we want to involve uh, our faculty, our parents, other members of our school community. So great conversation. And I look forward to the fireside chat when we can do it face to face instead of in chat. And so before I hand over the word to, to Tim, and you can go to the next slide, George, um, the fireside chat idea, uh, and we're very fortunate because uh, the panelist who actually came up with this idea is on the call today, which is Jorge, uh, and it was his idea. And he basically identified in the debrief uh, of, of the panel discussion he was, uh, he was part of, of how incredibly short <laughs> each panelist's intervention is and how incredibly rich and deep the content is that's being shared. So thank you, Jorge, for being, for being on the call and for offering a really amazing add-on to, to this whole format. So with no further ado, uh, Tim, take, us, uh, take it away, please. Thanks so much, Christoph. It's, it's wonderful to be a part of this panel today. And this, this robust conversation, which I'm, I'm looking forward to taking into the Fireside chat as soon as possible. So um, <clears throat> we'll pre present a few ideas here um, at the outset about 
how we can indeed, you know, carry this challenge forward. You know, the the frame of the the talk or the the panel today was um, on future proofing, and um, I, I sat with that idea a little bit and um, thought, well, I wonder if you know we could gently push back on that one a little bit and talk about um, potentially embracing the future. Um, so to the first slide there, thanks, George. Um, yeah, the idea of, of the future, you know, can be just an abstract or a threatening one to us. But if we if we lean into it and say, look, there's there's a lot of education that is that is really oriented in that direction. And to Al Olaf's point about you know being intentional about you know growing a particular culture in a school, um, and being intentional about spreading strategy around and creating value and those sorts of things. Those are ways that we're not always accustomed to thinking about school, um, but they are hugely important. And all of them really are contemplating the future. Um, but rather than you know, uh, think about it in a way to ward off the future or to you know, steel ourselves up against any change that might happen, what if we sort of reframe that and said, um, we should be embracing of the future? In appropriate ways, and particularly as we plan, and particularly as we think about, you know, writing educational plans for students and curricula and pedagogy, um, and communication around uh, learning, then you know perhaps that means that we ought to think about the future in a, in a different way and embrace it and incorporate it into our our thinking and uh, the way that we do school um, right now. So, in this brief chat i wanted to to highlight a few strategies and strategy is also part of our thrust and and a part of what we're talking about here and and one is to embrace um, an element of the future with technology next slide please george we we were promising that indeed we would um save this for the fireside chat which is going to be challenging to do um <laughs> but uh yeah, this this whole uh, phenomena of open AI, you know, knocking on our door and uh, presenting the, the one one of the things that could be a major um, disruptor in the, in, the, in the field of education and elsewhere in the world. And so what are we to do? Um, do we do we proof ourselves from it or do we embrace it? And and essentially the, the organization that I'm working with now um, is is designed to thoughtfully embrace elements of the future and to to try to incorporate that into the way that we do school the way that we offer learning opportunities to our students and the, the way that we collaborate with one another and so this is an intriguing disruptor that's just you know across the bow and um you know we'll, we'll talk more about it but if you go to the next slide please george um and you've got this from the Guardian, go to the next one, please. This from the Wall Street Journal. Next, please. This from Fortune. And by the way, I've attached all these articles and some resources that that Olaf can, or sorry, that uh, Christoph can share with you. Um, next slide, please. So this, I want to introduce you to to Savvy um, at Avenues. We um, have a, a research and development department, which is a little unusual. Tim Stewart was a part of one in Singapore American School. Um, we we are fortunate to have one at Avenues as well, and we're constantly trying to look towards the future to um, to to anticipate the things that we need to need to incorporate into the learning frame of our, our school and for our students. And so what we did is we actually anticipated the, the impact of AI um, and said, let's set up a, a, a chat bot for, for ourselves and try to put that into a pilot um, program and figure out how that might work because we see this coming um, down the road. This was in 2019, pre-pandemic, um, pre, -pandemic, um, pre open AI chat GPT. Um, and we put a button actually on the user interface for our online students and said, please use this chat bot to help you with your research. Um, 
we tried that. It was quite buggy. It didn't quite work in the way that we wanted. The pandemic came and we put it on hold uh, for a while. But what we've recently done is connected it to um, the language of chat GPT. And, and so Savvy now has um, a depth of utility that is, is really quite transformational. So we'll dig into that more in the fireside chat, but this is a way in which we've kind of embraced the future and said, you know, not only we do, are we not going to ban this, but we're going to make it readily available as a tool. Um, and there have been some universities that have, have done this as well. Uh, Wharton School um, in particular, there's an article about that uh, that we can share. Um, but we'll dig into this conversation later. But this is, this is a strategy that we've um, engaged in and said, look, we want to give tools for our students that will enable them to prepare themselves for the future. And this is an example of that. Um, so we'll all learn about the tool, its, its positives, its potential negatives together. Next slide, please. So just to, to put this into a context about learning and hearkening back to Tim Stewart's um, uh, references to John Hattie's work and the depth and um, breadth of learning that we're interested in. Bloom um, has sort of a taxonomy of learning and then also a digital taxonomy too. And this is, so if you look at sort of the red zone is what we're, we're targeting. So in the, in the construction of learning activities for Avenues Online, our online campus, we have these skills in the red zone as the outcomes that we're hoping for from our project-based learning assignments for our students. So we're, we're asking them to come up with you know, creative displays of their learning that incorporate the upper end of this taxonomy, um, just as a matter of course. So they're, they're finding you know, their voice, their creativity, their autonomy in that way. Um, and we're sort of leaning into technology um, in order to do that. Next slide, please. So here's another provocation, another challenge by Sugatra Mitra. Can read that quickly. So there's a scarcity in some places in, in the world, you know, where, you know, for whatever reasons, um, we don't have, you know, great opportunities for learning for students. And all students should have this. And so how can we solve that? There are people that just do not have this sort of access in the world. And so um, we've put our heads together to try to figure this out. Next slide, please. Um, what we've offered is uh, an opportunity for online learning, which actually makes available high quality learning to anyone in the world. Um, and what you primarily need is um, a Wi-Fi connection and a device. And that can be a barrier for some as well, but and so we've looked into ways to, to connect um, people with those, those elements also. Um, but as you can see from this, this map here, um, our current students are in about 25 countries. Our campuses uh, for avenues are in um, you know, several continents at this point. Um, we're, we're building very intentionally an ecosystem that will allow our students to, to learn together in different places um, that will enable them to really leverage um, the collaborative element of learning that was mentioned by Tim as well. Um, and they're collaborating online from different vantage points in the world real time or asynchronously or both. And uh, this, is, this is an opportunity to sort of break down some of the barriers that that we have constructed for school and uh, sort of blown it open and made it worldwide and made it accessible to to anyone. Um, so that's that's our hope at this point. So that's that's another um, element here. Could you go on the next slide, please? Um, yeah, world class education anytime, anywhere, uh, everywhere. Next, thank you. Um, so when we think about this, this strategy, it's sort of go back to the, the ideas of Archimedes. It's, you know, what are the levers that we need to use um, in education to actually impact change at the level that is needed? There was a good uh, discussion in the chat about um, some of the forces um, that have been intentional or unintentional about 
depriving students of their agency? Well, if we say, look, we, we need to have a high degree of agency for our students, then how do we change things in our schools in order to do that? What are the levers that we need to pull? Technology can be one of them. What's another one? Move on to the next slide, please. So with online education, uh, again, we can, we can think differently about what, what this might look like. Um, again, you are grounded in a place, even if you're learning online, you're physically somewhere. And that physical somewhere um, can offer you the opportunity for learning around you in the local community. And that's what we encourage also. Um, there's not only the collaboration for your students, fellow students online, but we are designing learning opportunities so that students will go forth into their community to try to seek out problems that need to be solved. So that's that's essentially the focus of um, the educational design for, for our online platform. So this notion of space and time um, with education, I think both Tim and Olaf um, were alluding to this also, is that school for, for many has been grounded in a place in a brick and mortar building. Um, if you blow that open and you say, okay, it can partially be there, sure, but what are the other ways in which students can learn and how might that be appropriate for them um, as they head off into the world? Um, living on sort of the, the crazy edge of, of education, so to speak, um, how can we, you know, again, embrace this, this opportunity to rethink space and time for learning? Next slide, please. Another strategy that we have um, is to leverage data. Again, both Tim and, and Olaf spoke about this too. If we are gathering data to inform how we are guiding students in their learning, and we make that available in a timely fashion, so we're not holding it until long after the fact, but we're offering it them quickly so that they can iterate upon their learning. Um, I was just on a call with some of our students earlier today, and they were talking about learning to fail and learning from failure, and that that was a, a real gift that they were taking forth um, from their time at Avenues Online. And so how can we build that opportunity to not only have the opportunity to fail, but then receive great feedback and data that will help them to um, make the strides forward in their learning? So there's so much that can be done with technology at this point and sharing it real time with our students. This is a tool right here this, that's showing the trajectory of a student's learning one year to the next. It's available to parents all the time. It's available to students and their teachers all the time. And so you can sort of see how they're moving along the path of their learning. This, this is a sort of a nascent strategy that we're getting better at, but embracing data and its power is, is part of it. Next slide, please. So again, thinking about space and time um, in a different way um, to the power of, of learning, um, to the power of change, to the power of your school. Um, if you're intentionally designing what that is, then what's that gonna look like? You know, what are the things, what are the levers that you need to pull? What are the, the strategies that you need to think about um, redesigning in your school and, and how can you make immediate impact. Next and last slide, please. So as we're thinking into the future here, you know, we all can be challenged by this notion. What does rethink possible mean for you? What, what can that mean for your leadership team? What can it mean for your faculty? What can it mean for your parents and students in your community? Um, if you sort of have this as a way of embracing the future going forward, it might be a good thing to keep in mind. And I look forward to the conversation that we're gonna have in the fireside and uh, hereafter. Thanks so much. Thank you very, very much, Tim. And uh, yeah, I, I love how uh, your choice of words of gently pushing uh, against the, the future proofing concept, because when we first talked, I was like, oh my God, what's gonna happen here? And, and, it's, and it's true, it's true. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's the question of embracing the future. And it's um, one of the, one of the um, concepts I've become really, really attuned with is increasing your comfort in discomfort. 
And this is a great way to build resilience and, and, and growth. Um, and that goes hand in hand with uh, the, 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 the willingness to be vulnerable. Uh, and, and to to acknowledge uh, limitations. And for anybody who's interested in vulnerability as a concept, there's an author I'm a very big fan of called Brene Brown. Uh, she's she's become pretty big in many spaces, and I know education is not is also one of them. But Brene Brown is one of those authors that really helps you as a person, but also as an organization. And I think that's the analogy I'd like to make because ultimately, in my mind, you know, what we have as a person, as an organization, is also an organism. Uh, and a lot of those same things apply when you're talking about an organism versus uh, an organization versus yourself, um, that being able to feel vulnerable, understand vulnerability and lean into vulnerability is, is probably the best pre prerequisite to, uh, to embracing uh, that future instead of fighting it. As I said at the beginning, you know, the waves are going to come. So you can be the rock uh, and get all smooth and eventually go to dust, or you can be a surfer. Uh, and surfing is hard. I've tried it. Trust me, it's really hard. <laughs> and it's painful too sometimes. <laughs> so with that being said, George, thank you very, uh, thank you very, very much, Tim, uh, for this really insightful uh, concluding piece. Um, I'm going to let George take over, uh, and then we're going to move into the fireside chat and the recording will stop at that point. But then we can speak freely and openly. Thanks, Christoph, and uh, thank you to all of our uh, panelists, and thank you to all of our participants today. We really appreciate you joining us. We want to remind you uh, that we always uh, value continuing the conversation, so we hope you'll stay with us for the fireside chat, but we also have a couple of opportunities to meet and greet with you. Uh, I will be at the AAIE conference in Washington, D.C. on February 6th, 7th, and 8th with a number of my NIAS colleagues. Please stop by our table and say hi. We'd love to see you and have an opportunity to talk with you face-to-face. Uh, -face. Also, uh, to let you know, Christoph and I will be at the ECIS conference in Dusseldorf, Germany in April. Uh, we're in the process of organizing our strategic roundtable, uh, which will be held on Friday, April 28th. So we hope uh, if you are in Dusseldorf at ECIS, that you'll come and say hi to us and maybe join us for our roundtable. The next online strategy roundtable uh, will be held on March 16th. The topic will be developing and implementing a purposeful DEI strategy for your school community. So we hope that you'll have uh, the opportunity to join us then. So on behalf of myself, Christoph, our panelists, uh, we would like to thank you again for joining us. We hope that you'll stay with us for the fireside chat. And if not, we hope that we'll have an opportunity to see you soon, either in person or on our next strategic roundtable uh, on the 16th of March. So with that, I am going to end our recording.